You're now tuned in to the Desire to Trade podcast, a show where we bring you the best figures of the trading world and teach you how you can become a successful trader. This is your host, Etienne Kret. Hey, what's up, trader? It's Nkrat here from the Desire to Trade. And welcome to episode 61 of the Desire to Trade podcast. In this episode, I'm interviewing Carly Garner, and I was intrigued by her new book called Higher Probability Commodity Trading. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that I don't know much to commodity trading, and that I was some sort of impatient to know a little bit more about it and how it works. In this interview, we talked a lot about how to start in commodity trading and how to trade options as well, because Carly is trading options as well. She talked about option selling specifically, which is pretty interesting, but hard for me to understand at the beginning. So we'll get a good understanding of how commodity trading works. And I really hope this is going to benefit you well. Now, it is always a pleasure to bring this show, these interviews to you. And I'll come back at the end with the takeaways. Carly Garner, welcome to the Desire Trade Podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's definitely a pleasure. And I must say, first of all, that you are a community trader, and it's something that we didn't have at all before in the podcast. We didn't have any community traders, so we'll be, I'm really excited to talk about that today and excited about getting some knowledge about this and getting your vision of it probably also. Great. All right. Sounds fun. And the first thing we always ask the guests is, what is one quote that inspires you? Well, there are a lot of them, so it's hard to pick one, but off the top of my head, probably the best quote of all time, in my opinion, is it's one that you hear all the time. Uh, it was, I'm quoting Warren Buffett here. Be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Because I tend to have a kind of a contrarian mindset and approach to trading. So that's kind of what I, I try to keep in the back of my mind. In other words, you know, jumping on the bandwagon to follow the herd is usually not the best idea. So we're usually baiting when, you know, when everybody else is buying, we like to look at possibly doing the opposite. I love it. So what are you doing these days exactly? Well, I mean, we, we're a brokerage firm, so we have clients that do anything you could possibly imagine, any strategy, any approach. But it, we tend to be pro-option sellers. So we do a lot of, like, as far as the recommendations we make to our clients and the things that we do, you know, on our own, it tends to be focused on option selling. The markets are so quiet right now. It seems a little bit dangerous to be doing a whole lot of option selling because I don't know if you, how much you you know about option selling, but the, the basic idea is an option seller is kind of acts as an insurance company almost, you know, they're selling the option to the person that's buying it. So the person that's buying the option is basically placing a wager saying, I think that something is going to happen. For example, if you bought a crude oil $60 call, you'd be saying, I think crude oil is going to be above $60 in 30 days from now when the option expires, the option seller is taking the opposite bet. The option seller is saying, I don't think that event is going to happen. And most options expire worthless. So in the overall scheme of things, option selling is a, prob a higher probability strategy. But the problem is when you're selling options, you have unlimited risk and limited profit potential. As a buyer, it's the opposite. You have limited risk and unlimited profit potential. But the problem with being a buyer versus a seller is the odds aren't in your favor as a buyer and they are as a seller. So we do a lot of those sorts of things. You know, Right now, because everything is so quiet, the options are underpriced. And it's not the best time to be selling options. So we don't really have a whole lot going on. But I, I tend to think that we've had a big rally in crude oil recently. I tend to think that's probably going to be short-lived seasonally. Crude oil tends to go down the second half of the year. And you know, as much as I'd love to see crude oil go higher, it's on top of the bearish seasonals, the, the fundamentals are a little questionable. So I think we will probably see crude oil fade a little bit. I tend to be bearish in the E-mini S&P just simply because Every sentiment indicator that I look at, sentiment reading, most traders and investors are bullish or at least neutral. There are very few bears out there anymore. They've all kind of just been wiped out. And usually when a market gets overly bullish, it's hard to continue on the same path. So that's, yeah, those are kind of the two markets we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally right. And are options something you've always been attracted to or is it something you got on pretty later in your trading career? Um, no, actually, I've been in tuned uh, with options uh, from day one. I've been in the business for about 12 years and I've gravitated towards options simply because I'm, I tend to be, I, I mean, I live in Las Vegas. It's like the gambling city, right? So the last thing I need to do is gamble in my, in my trading account and, and things like that. So options are really just a way to participate in the market with generally lower risk and generally a slower pace. Like if you're trading futures or Forex, 
you're going to make or lose money a lot more quickly than you would if you're trading options. But that's not necessarily a good thing because, you know, as we all know, you have to leave yourself room for error in trading. And that's exactly what options do. They give people a little more room for error, slows things down, takes the, some of the stress out of it. Mm-hmm. And people often wonder about how did you start to trade exactly? So how exactly did that start and when? Well, I mean, honestly, it's not that exciting of a story. I, in college, I was uh, an intern at a stock brokerage house. And that was kind of what I was planning on doing is being a stockbroker. But uh, as I started to get into it, you know, deeper into the internship, I realized a lot of it was really just selling mutual funds with heavy loads. And I really, I, I just didn't see any value in the service. So I thought maybe I'd try something else. And I just happened to kind of stumble across it. And, um, you know, I, I liked it. It's fun. Commodities are exciting. There's, there's lots of leverage built into the markets, which is, can be good or bad, depending on what side of the trade you're on. But it, one thing is for sure, you learn something new every day. And it keeps us interested. So, so I love it. Mm-hmm. And how was the learning process? Did you struggle to make you as a trader? Yeah. I mean, it, the thing about the commodity markets is it's a, a constant learning process. Even though I've been doing this for a long time and I still make mistakes and I still make big ones. It is what it is. But the idea is you have to pick up the pieces and learn from them and, and move on. So absolutely, it, it's a struggle to learn, learn the markets. I mean, obviously, you know, we all probably know all the chart patterns and all the, you know, we kind of know what we're looking for, for fundamentals and all those sorts of things. But the, the thing that you can't ever predict is human behavior. I mean, humans, it's true. Humans have tendency to behave in certain ways, but you just never know what the limits are. And that's where people, you know, traders get in trouble is, you know, sometimes markets just go further and faster than they logically should, but you can't question it. The market's always right. You just have to trade what you see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. And speaking of mistakes, what are some of the main mistakes you've made in the past or the biggest ones? And are you still making the same today? Okay. Well, I mean, as far as if, if we're talking specifically trading mistakes, probably the biggest mistake we've made is, I mentioned before, we're, we tend to, to recommend option selling to our clients. And we had put out a recommendation for a crude oil strangle, let's see, almost two years ago. Now, I remember the date well, because it was a tough situation. But uh to make a long story short, we put out a crude oil strangle. The idea is we were betting, we were short the strangle. So we were betting that crude oil would stay within a specific range. I don't remember the exact strike prices, but we were giving plenty of room on both sides of the market. So on paper, it looked like a high probability trade. What we didn't really properly account for was there was an OPEC meeting that was actually not even scheduled, but it was just kind of a tentatively scheduled. There wasn't an exact date. And they ended up having an OPEC meeting on Thanksgiving Day when the markets were closed in the United States. So just the lack of liquidity and then the shock to the system due to the OPEC announcement, it caused crude oil. I think the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, actually ended up opening crude for like a couple hours on Thanksgiving Day, even though most people had absolutely no idea. Most people were eating turkey and didn't had no clue what was going on. But because of the OPEC meeting, they decided to open for a couple hours. And I think at one point, crude was down like $8 in that two-hour period. So we really took a, a big beating on that. And so I've kind of learned my lesson, you know, never underestimate holiday markets. When things are thin, prices can really be pushed dramatically. And so you want to try to be almost flat the market or maybe even just, you know, if you're going to have positions on over the holidays, keep them real light. So we learned our lesson. Mm-hmm. And I guess this is something you don't repeat all the time, right? So it's a mistake you do once and then you kind of get your lesson. Hopefully that's the goal. Yeah. Hopefully we learn from them. So Last year, you better believe we were keeping things pretty light over the Thanksgiving holiday. <laughs> <laughs> and what would be some of your best trades? Well, I mean, that's kind of hard to answer. And, and here's why. Because as an option seller, you are essentially, you're going to make money on more trades than you're going to lose. But the ones you're going to lose on are probably going to be pretty big. And so it's a little different than futures trading or option buying where you're looking for the big, you know, to catch the ride and catch the big wave. So option sellers really don't ever have any super exciting trades. If they're making money, it means that they're picking up, you know, maybe four or five hundred bucks on this trade and four or five hundred on this trade. So it's not like you you really swing for the fence. It's more of a base set strategy. So I'm not sure there's really anything exciting enough to answer that question with. And what would you recommend for people who are starting out an option? Would you say they have to focus on either selling or buying options? Or what would be the best way to do it? Good question. Depending on risk aversion, account size, those types of things, all of those will come into play as far as you know what's really the right way to go about it. 
a couple of things that I'd, I'd mention. If you're new to commodities and you want to get involved, maybe it might not be the best choice to, to jump in r- right off the bat with options. You might actually want to look at the e-micros, which they have in gold and the currencies, and then they also have many grains, so like mini corn and mini wheat. And the only reason I say that as opposed to the options is the risk is actually going to be a lot lower on the mini and micro futures than they are on the options, which are written against the full-size contracts. So if you're just getting your toes wet, look for the e-micros and and e-minis. I actually have in my new book, Higher Probability Commodity Trading, I I have a whole chapter dedicated just to that, looking at the micros and minis. To It's almost like paper trading with a little bit of skin in the game. So it's a great way to get involved. So if you're already in the commodity markets and you're comfortable with the risks and rewards, and then you want to start looking at options, honestly, I think you're better off maybe doing some option spreads, or I still am a fan of short options selling as long as you're doing it the right way. So if you're not, if you've never sold options before, make sure you're talking to someone or you're, you have some, a support team or a broker that can help you with that. Another strategy that's kind of a combination of the two that I think is good for a lot of beginning option traders, especially those that are accustomed to trading futures or Forex, and they want to dabble with options is kind of a covered call strategy. So for example, if you're bullish in, let's say, crude oil, but you don't want to take the risk of just going long a futures contract and you know seeing what happens, you can go long a futures contract and then maybe sell a call or two against it to bring in premium. And that premium basically cushions your downside risk. So it's, it's almost like it slows the trade down. It brings cash into the account to, and it increases your probability of success, you know, without fully abandoning the idea of trading futures. Mm-hmm. And then what is your, the approach that you would use whenever you're going to, let's say, trade options? Are you going to look for technical analysis or are you only going to look at fundamentals? Okay. In my opinion, I think you're best off looking at a little bit of everything. So I would say like if I had to break it down, I'd say I'm looking a technical analysis for about 85 to 90% of the decision. And then for the remaining 15, I'm looking at fundamentals. I'm also looking at seasonals. And another thing I look at is market sentiment or the COT report. In commodities, they have a thing that's called the Commitment of Traders Report. It's issued by the CFTC, which is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And every week, the CFTC puts out a report telling market participants who is long and who is short. And what I mean by that is they separate traders by big traders and by small traders and by hedgers. And then they tell you who's long or short. And so what we like to look for is if the big traders, and those are the guys with big money, they're trading big size. If those guys get too long or too short, that's kind of a telltale sign that the market's probably getting ready to reverse and the trend's probably extended itself. Because I mean, the, the theory is if all the bulls and all the big money is already long, then there's nobody left to buy. So we like to look at those types of things. Mm-hmm. And from that thing, I understand that you, you're going to basically trade reversals, right? It's not going to be, you're not going to trade between two extremes, right? Yeah, generally, like if, I mean, everybody looks at the COT report a little different and gets a little different information out of it or reads it a little differently. But in my opinion, I think it's best served by basically identifying overheated markets. So you're right. We would, uh, if we think a market's overheated, there's too many bulls, everybody's long we might look for a strategy that plays the other side, looks for a reversal. So how long would we be willing to hold the same view of the market? Let's say you're going to be thinking that the market is bullish. How, where would you say that the market's bearish? Or where would you be not willing to keep your trade? Well, the, the thing to keep in mind is generally, and not always generally, like, for example, right now, we've recommended that our clients go along the, the grain. So like corn and soybeans, which are really cheap, in my opinion, but who knows, maybe they'll get cheaper. You know, we've kind of liked the idea of, of being long in a small way using the mini contracts. We, in a situation like that, we would not sell puts because the options are cheap because the volatility is low. So in a situation like that, we have the lasting power where, where we can just hang on. We can be really wrong and still write it out and hopefully, you know, be on the right side eventually. Because the thing about commodities is they're not like stocks that continually go up throughout time. Commodities tend to trade in ranges. They can be big ranges but they tend to trade in ranges and they'll, once they get really expensive, then the fundamentals shift and suddenly, you know, prices reverse. And then we come to the the other end of the pendulum, which things are cheap. So like for right now in corn market, we have a big supply glut. So prices are cheap, but the thing that's going to happen is farmers are going to stop planting corn because they can make more money planting a different crop. And then the supply for corn will begin to dwindle and prices will jump back up the other way. So the key 
to trading commodities maybe is just lasting power and being able to last. So in other words, I guess what I'm trying to say is we tend to take not a long-term approach, but a swing traders approach where we're not looking to, you know, we're not day trading. We're not looking to be in and out in a, in a day or two. Generally on a trade like that, we might hold it a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. So with option trading, it's similar. We're position trading. However, kind of the rule of thumb that we try to use, it doesn't always work out this perfectly, but the idea is if we sell an option and it doubles in value, then we're probably wrong. So like if we sell an option for 500 bucks and it becomes worth a thousand, then we probably say we need to at least adjust the trade or throw in the towel because we're probably wrong. And so that's the rule of thumb. Sometimes the market moves too fast to, for us to abide by that rule. In option trading, you can't place stop orders. So it's a little more complicated, but that's the guideline we try to behave according to. And when you see you manage the risk and the risk is unlimited, how do you make sure that you don't, let's say, lose too much on a single trade? Right. And that's the key with option selling. It's just like I mentioned before, it's kind of like being the insurance company or you know, being the casino where every, you're gonna, over time, you're probably going to consistently make money. People are paying their insurance premiums or gamblers are putting money in the slot machine, but eventually you're going to have to pay a jackpot. And so that's kind of the, the other side of the coin there. There are ways to sell options with limited risk. Like, so for those of you that can't sleep at night knowing that your risk is unlimited, I totally understand that. And you can do option spread. That might mean if you're selling a put option, you'd buy a put underneath it for protection, kind of an insurance policy just in case something goes horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's how people do it. Okay. Thanks. Right. And so, what would you say is the best way for people to go about option selling then? What do they have to look for? What I like to do. I look for volatility. So really the key to option selling is not being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the best way to prevent that from happening or to attempt to prevent that from happening is to make sure you're establishing your trade when the getting is good. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's not any different than being a retailer. You know, if you're selling your clothes from the discount rack, you're not making money. You want to sell things at top dollar. So being an option seller is the same general idea. And the thing to keep in mind is options are generally overpriced and more attractive to option sellers against the trend and during high volatility. So for instance, you might want to sell a put in the S&P after a big downturn. It's going to seem illogical. You're going to think, well, why would you sell a put when the S&P is crashing? Well, the reason is because everybody else and their dog is trying to buy those puts. They're bidding the prices up. And so you get kind of abnormality in pricing. There's sometimes when the S&P is down big on a day, 20 to 40 handles, you can see some deep out of the money puts that have tripled in value in a single day. And it's not necessarily that the odds of the market getting to those, the strike price of those puts has increased, but just the market's panicking and you know, you're trading emotions. So if you wait for those spikes of volatility and try to, to catch options after they've tripled or quadrupled in value, then you're, I believe your odds of success are a little better. And do you focus on specific commodities or do you look at everything and then like look at specific things to trade? The thing about volatility is it, it rotates from market to market to market. And then every once in a while, you'll have one of those big kind of global you know, meltdown things where everything moves all at once. So you want to be careful that you don't have too many positions on that could possibly be correlated. But with that said, I think the best idea is to stick with liquid markets and kind of, you know, don't just pick one market and always have premium in there because guess what? Eventually, if you're selling premium in one market and you always have a trade on, eventually you're just going to be caught on the wrong side of something. So I think it's better to kind of pick and choose. So for example, some markets that we look at are corn, wheat, believe it or not, we even look at cattle. Every once in a while, cattle gets really out of control. If it's limit down a couple of days, we might consider selling puts because that's exactly when all the puts are overpriced. We do some crude oil option trading. Uh, we look at the euro and every once in a while, some of the other currencies and also treasuries in the E-mini S&P. And what are some of the biggest mistakes you see people make when they start in trading options? You know, the biggest mistake people make trading options uh, when they start out is it's not unlike Forex or futures trading. They really just get overzealous. They're trading too much. They're taking on too much risk. They're not leaving enough excess margin in their accounts. And so essentially by doing all of these three things, they are not giving themselves enough room for error. So, I mean, a lot of times people will eventually be right in their speculation, but lose money in the market because they either ran out of margin or ran out of money. So the key is lasting power. If you have an opinion and you have a system that you feel good about, make sure you're giving yourself enough room for error to let that play out. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and I see some people that are going to put way too much risk on one single trade, and then they're going to blow up. And right. it's probably the same thing that happens to option selling, right? Or option in general. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the same thing. If you're over leveraged and you you have too much concentration on one particular trade, then you know every once in a while people will get lucky and they'll they'll hit the home run trade doing that sort of thing. But it's just a matter of time before it catches up with them. So the better idea is to just keep it measured, trade within your means. And like I said, give yourself some room for error. And how would you go about developing a plan that traders can use to trade in options? Right. Well, I mean, the thing that I emphasize in in my newest book is there's really not a right or wrong way to trade. There's just a way that you're comfortable with. And what I mean by that is the difference between success and failure in trading is probably 90% mental. It probably isn't so much. I mean, you want to have a trading plan and you want to have everything mapped out beforehand, but really making money comes down to how you react to stressful situations or even, you know, letting your ego get out of control if you have a winning streak, those types of things. So it's important to have a trading plan and it's important to have a backup plan, like a contingency plan if something goes wrong, because if you don't, you're going to make emotional decisions and that sort of thing. And, And actually, even if you do have a trading plan, a lot of people will stray from it because they do get emotional. But the way to keep your emotions in check as much as possible is to simply trade within your means. Trade small. And then as you get more comfortable, you know, maybe start trading bigger, but keep it small in the beginning and and work your way up. I'm figuring that probably one of the challenges people have with option is to test it, right? To to be comfortable trading it. Because I think in Forex for futures, you can backtest, you can go back in time. But can Mm -hmm. you do the same in options trading? Yeah, no, that is a very, very good point. In theory, like you can buy historical data or some platforms have it, but you can buy historical data from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So in theory, you could go and backtest strategies, but it's not nearly, the backtesting is not nearly as accurate as it would be with futures and Forex because in options, you're basically just be, would be looking at settlement prices and settlement prices might have absolutely no bearing on what actually happened during the trading day. I've seen options like, for example, the S&P last year in August when the S&P was crashing almost, <laughs> I think you could almost call it a crash. There were, you know, like there were options that were started the day at $10 in premium, which is 500 bucks. And then at one point during the trading day, they traded at like two to $3,000. So they like more than tripled in value in a couple hours. But then by the close of the day, they were back to $10. So somebody back testing a strategy might say, okay, well, I would have broken even that day. That wouldn't have been very stressful. But in reality, in order for that to have broken even on that day, they might have had to write out a huge, huge loss and suffered a lot of emotional turmoil. So you're right. Backtesting on options is not nearly as realistic as it might be on futures or Forex. So then how would you recommend people to build a confidence to trade options? Well, I think it really comes down to, you know, practicing with real money, but just going small. So for example, The good thing about option selling and futures as opposed to stocks is you can do it with a relatively small account. I mean, you could do it with five or 10,000 if you're trading a one lot contract and just keeping it far out of the money. So it's really one of those things that practice makes perfect. Well, maybe perfect's not the right word, but you want to practice in a very small scale to kind of get the hang of it. And then if you're comfortable and you like the idea of it, you can expand from there. But I'd say that's probably the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I do want to talk a little bit about your book because I know you probably have some great content there for community traders. And the first thing that really that I really noticed about this book is that you think about higher probability, right? Because this is the key in option trading. Whenever you're going to sell options, you want to have high probability, as you said. Right. So what exactly are the key factors that people have to build up to trade options from your book? Okay. Well, the book covers, when it talks about higher probability trading, it talks of a lot of things as far as picking a trading strategy, for example, trend trading versus swing trading or you know option spread trading versus naked options and all those sorts of things. So we talk about the different probabilities in a bigger scope, but a lot of it, you're right, is focused on the idea of as an option seller, whether you're selling options against a futures contract to do a covered call or you're just selling options naked or whatever the case is, you are automatically putting the, the odds of success in your favor if you can control you know, the small percentage of trades that are, are going to go against you or go against you big. So it's really kind of a, a numbers game. But we talk about some of the things that I've already talked about in this interview as far as putting the odds in your favor. It's not as simple, even though let's just assume that 
the studies are correct and eight out of 10 options expire worthless. That doesn't mean it's as simple as just randomly selling options and assuming that you're going to make money on 80% of your trades because it's really not that easy. Because that tells us, like, even if that number is correct, it's not telling us what happened in between. You know, the day that we sold it to the day it expired worthless, then maybe there's 30 to 60 days in there. Let's just assume it's 30. But during that 30 days before it expired worthless, you might have been losing a substantial amount of money on the option before it finally expired worthless. So it's not nearly as easy as it seems looking at the the numbers. And so we give people in, in the book some pointers on how to prevent those things, you know, the big drawdowns and that sort of thing. And a lot of it is, like I mentioned before, is making sure you're selling into volatility. So, you know, you don't have to be in a rush to sell an option. Take your time. Wait until the market's at a ridiculous extreme so that you can sell an option deep, deep out of the money and no, you know, be relatively comfortable. To give you an idea, I know this was a long, long time ago, but I distinctly remember in 2008, March of 2008, when the S&P was trading in the 700s, which it's hard to imagine that that even happened, but it did. At that time, it was possible to sell options with strike prices of 500 or 450 in that ballpark, 450 to 500 for several hundred dollars a piece with less than 30 days to expiration. That's how wild the pricing was. So you're probably not going to get an opportunity like that again anytime soon, but you might get something close. So for example, right now with the S&P at 2200, let's say from out of nowhere, we finally go into correction and the S&P drops down to 1900. I would bet it's a, this is an estimate. I mean, who knows what reality will be, but if the S&P drops to 1900, most people are going to The thing is with people, they tend to play the trend. So Right now, nobody is interested in buying S&P puts because they think the market's going up forever, but eventually it will go into correction. And then when the market gets down to 1900, then all of a sudden everyone's going to go, wait a minute, the market's going down. I need to buy some puts. And so that's when they buy puts. And I bet if this happened and you shopped around, you could find strike prices of like 1500 or 1600. So they're substantially under the market. And I bet you could sell them for a nice amount of money. So those are the types of things you look for. You don't want to be the guy that's selling puts when the S&P is at an all-time high. You want to be the guy that's trying to sell puts after the S&P is taking a big tumble and the options are overpriced. Mm -hmm. And when you say looking for a good price, how do you look for those prices? How do you shop for those options? What I look for is I want to see an option that is ideally tripled in value in a short period of time. And usually when, when an option explodes like that, then the market's already accounting for continued move. So for example, you know, there's been times in, in crude oil that we have sold options that one day, like let's say last week, an option was trading at 20 cents and the market makes a move and suddenly we're trading at 60 to 70 cents. Those are the options we look for because most of that premium that's built in that the difference between 20 and 60 is really just market emotion and anticipation. And it's already usually priced in a continuation of the move. So if the market calms down, cooler heads prevail, and the options often lose value really quickly. So those are what we're looking for. If they've tripled or quadrupled in value, those are the ones we like to see. And what would be the percentage of winning trade that people should expect with options? Should they go for 80% or 90% win? Well, I mean, the idea is, like I said, that, you know, generally speaking, 80% of options expire worthless. But like I said, it's not that easy. So I would say like a healthy win percentage, you'd probably want to shoot for 60 to 70% would be your goal. Some people might do a little better. Some people might do a little worse. It depends on how they're going about it because not all option selling strategies are the same. Some option sellers go deep, deep, deep out of the money and then sell in high quantities and others go closer to the money and sell in low quantities. And the, you know, the outcome can be pretty dramatically different. So it's not all the same. And any other advice you would have for aspiring or current commodity traders or option traders at this point? Yeah, I think we've covered a lot of the bases. The best advice I can give is trade within your means and make sure you're comfortable. If you're uncomfortable, if you can't sleep at night or you're stressing out, it means that you're trading beyond your means. And if that's the case, you're going to make bad decisions and you're probably going to lose money. You might lose a lot of it because the, the thing is, if you keep your emotions in check and you know if you're trading at a level that you can make sound decisions, you're probably going to be a lot better off. And you do have a lot of offers. How can people find you exactly? The best place to find me is at, through our website. It's decarleytrading.com. That's D-E-C-A-R-L-E-Y, 
Trading.com, and we have free newsletters. We have a lot of educational videos on the site. We have a lot of educational articles. And of course, you can also buy uh, higher probability commodity trading. It's uh, my new book. It came out last month, and we're really excited about it. Great. And I guess you're always on social media as well, so people can follow you there, right? Absolutely. Yeah. At Carly Garner on Twitter. And uh, you can see me on Facebook, Instagram. If you just do a search, it'll pop right up. Great. And so, Carly, what kind of goal do you have for the future? I t- as a commodity trader, because everything is on leverage and it's just the lifestyle, honestly, we don't tend to look that far in the future. We're, t- we're looking, if we can survive the next six months, we're, we're happy. But I mean, long term, as far as our business goes, we really just want to continue growing. And so far, so good. And what is your main motivation to keep growing? Well, I'm not going to lie. I'm money motivated. <laughs> so, so that's it. There's no, uh, I can't sugarcoat it. Sorry. That's great. And I just want to remind the listeners that all the show notes are going to be on desiretrade.com. So if people want to find the link we talked about, all the links to find you is all going to be on desiretrade.com. And I'll make sure to put the link to your book as well. So people want to find the link, it's going to be there. And that would Carly, be great. we have one question we always ask every single guest. Okay. And it is, if you could give only one piece of advice for traders, what would that one piece of advice be? You know what? The piece of advice I can give you is take your time. The markets are not going anywhere. I, I meet so many people that are in such a rush to get into the markets, to jump in, start trading. And then if things are quiet, like today, you know, today's market conditions are extremely quiet. The best thing to do is just turn off your computer and walk away. But unfortunately, some people just don't have the patience to turn away. They feel like they have to be in the markets because if they're not, they're missing opportunities. But the reality is the opportunity in a quiet market is to be on the sidelines and be ready to take advantage of volatility when it does finally come back. Love it. Love it. Carly Garner, thanks so much for being in our podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. So definitely some great lesson in this interview. And one of the things that I like that Carly mentioned is the fact that you have to be fearful when others are greedy. She mentioned taking your time because it's not a game of going faster to get results necessarily, but it's a game of taking your time, but putting in the work that you need to put in to get the result you want. Now, I strongly recommend that you pick one thing from this interview and that you apply it to your trading. This week, or even if possible today. And that's how you'll see results. Now, it's always a pleasure for me to bring those interviews. And I would love if you can leave feedback, either on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play, just to let me know what the podcast is for you and how I can improve it. Because I want to do my best to bring you the best value out of this podcast. The goal is to bring the lesson that people pay for totally free on the podcast. And the more review we have, the easier it's going to be to reach more people. So I look forward for this. If you want to connect with me after the show, check out our Facebook group at desiretotrade.com forward slash group, and you can network with me there, meet other traders, or simply ask a question and share any takeaways you had from the podcast. Now on that note, we have a great interview coming up next week, and I'll see you back next week for episode 62 of the Desire Trade Podcast. Ciao. Thanks for listening to the Desire to Trade Podcast. To get all the information on this show, free articles, and unique resources, make sure to check out www.desiretotrade.com and subscribe. Please leave us a review and let us know what you thought about the show. It's time to become the best trader you can be. See you next time.